But thank you very much for staying this long and for the contributions you've been making over uh, the course of this conference. Um, the idea of this panel is to be slightly less interactive than many of the sessions that we've had, um, but is for four people who've been chairing and, and pre presenting to give that us reflections of what they've heard, themes that they pick, take away, and that may be a stimulus to us. We will aim to finish uh, by half past four, um, so obviously those... That, but I, I, I would understand that if um, a number of you have got particular um, requirements to get away, um, no, just, just do, do so discreetly. Um, I'll first ask uh, Cheryl Saunders to, to give us a, a, a view from a very, person very experienced in public law and having seen public law from more or less the totality of the common law world. Um, and, and therefore, a, a, a person well placed to assess uh, some of the themes that have been coming out for the, from this period. Hey, don't do up no, you might as well sit okay? at the table okay. as well. Okay, well, I'm uh, honoured to uh, be asked to participate on this last panel, and I'm relieved to be the first speaker because I have a feeling that what I have to say is uh, so ordinary that uh, the chances are that. Um, they're just very obvious concluding remarks uh, at a conference of this kind. Uh, but let me begin by endorsing the remarks that John uh, Bell made himself uh, in the opening session of this conference when he said there, uh, that, that Cambridge thought there'd been a need for a conference that brought together uh, common law public lawyers and, moreover, that provided a mechanism for bringing them together uh, again. Uh, and I agree with that. Uh, we have enough in common uh, to make deep comparison fruitful, fruitful across common law jurisdictions, but we're sufficiently different to make comparison a source of insight. And I must say, we're sufficiently culturally trained to comply with a requirement for 15-minute presentations uh, as well. The common law is a rather odd beast from a comparative point of view. Uh, and especially its public law subset, uh, which is so closely intertwined with politics and the structure of the administration. For decades, when the common law was broadly regarded as unified, common lawyers from very different uh, states across the world discussed legal questions as if context was either irrelevant or so similar that it made no difference. I remember participating in a um, comparative administrative law conference run by Hugh Corder about 10 years ago in South Africa where people from India and Malaysia and Australia and Canada all descended on Cape Town and solemnly exchanged views about mandamus as if we all came from, <laughs> from East London. Uh, and in a sense we have the same familiarity uh, now uh, when Sir John Law's uh, referred the other night to error within and outside jurisdiction as being the old metaphysics. We all immediately understood what that was all about and fell into our, our standard positions. Uh, but times have changed, and in an era when it's fashionable to argue that legal and constitutional systems are converging across the world, in a sense, common law legal systems are bucking the trend uh, and are diversifying, and the diversification continues. We've had numerous examples of that uh, over the last two days, uh, not least in, our, in relation to our position on the old metaphysics, uh, but also on a number of other matters, uh, whether the grounds for review are substantive or procedural, the conception of judicial power, approaches to statutory interpretation, the meaning of the principle of legitimacy. I won't drag you through all the, the points of difference. You'll be only too aware of them uh, yourselves. This diversification is partly, of course, the product of the relaxation of appellate ties, uh, setting up the possibility of the various national systems of common law, the common law of Australia, of Canada, of New Zealand, uh, and so on. And in Australia, this uh, legal nationalism has been further consolidated uh, through insisting that there's a single common law. So it's not diverse within Australia, it's just diverse between Australia uh, and the rest of the world. But equally significant, I think, has been the passage of time as each of these 
national systems of common law has adapted to the constitutional, political, legal, bureaucratic, supranational, etc., cetera, uh, context in which it operates. The how and why of that divergence has been the subject of a lot of discussion over the last few days, and there's a lot more to be said about it. Uh, but in the meantime, I think, uh, just in closing, it's worth reflecting upon the significance of, of the divergence. On at least some questions, it creates a comparative challenge for common law public lawyers in considering whether the principles and practices operating in one jurisdiction are actually transferable to others and on, one, on, on what conditions. Uh, so that, for example, the extent of deference, judicial deference, uh, and the manner in which it's shown is such a question, uh, and considering the transferability of those sorts of practices uh, requires attention to be paid to things like the constitutional setting, the structure of the administration, and legal and political culture. Where differences between common law systems call for comparative techniques, it may affect judicial reasoning as well. And there's a link here to that rather irritating de debate about judicial references to foreign law that was sparked by United States decisions uh, a, a, de a decade or so ago. That debate has certainly not stopped what I consider to be a very healthy practice uh, in the rest of the common law world. But in, in at least some states, including my own, it's coincided with caution on the parts of the courts about references to foreign law, not to stop them, but to uh, encourage the use of comparative method and sometimes to uh, encourage the distinguishing uh, of other common law jurisdictions on the grounds of differences of some kind. Now, public lawyers like us can, of course, help to sort out whatever problems uh, are presented by such comparative um, difficulties. But there's another challenge as well, I think, and that is to prevent the baby being thrown out with the bathwater altogether. Um, it's helpful, I think, for us to emphasise not just our differences, but the extraordinarily similarities in values, concepts, principles and analytical tools across the common law world to maintain the mechanisms for cross-fertilisation of ideas and experiences, uh, even if at the same time we are also taking context into account. And conferences of this kind provide tremendous assistance uh, for that, I think, very important purpose. Let me just make one final uh, concluding remark. The concept of public law, uh, as it's been engaged for the purposes of this conference, has brought together administrative lawyers and constitutional lawyers primarily. Uh, even there, and they're, they're, that's a very sort of neat combination of public lawyers, and many of us teach across uh, both subjects, but even there it's been possible to identify differences of approaches uh, between participants depending on uh, which is their primary area of expertise. Notably absent from the program has been anything by way of specific reference to international law, transnational law, regional law, the globalization of public law and all those other uh, trendy developments uh, that um, have featured so prominently on much of the half literature stand uh, out the front uh, for the duration of the conference. Um, and the corollary of that, that is that there's not too many people here who have expertise in international law, uh, except perhaps uh, as, um, as a by, uh, as, a, as a second string to their bow. I've been in two minds over the last couple of days about whether that's a pity uh, or not. Uh, in my experience, uh, domestic public lawyers and international lawyers uh, tend to talk past each other. Uh, and while that might be a reason for getting them together, it actually can also be uh, rather counterproductive uh, and annoying. Uh, on the other hand, um, the two, those two areas of law, domestic public law and public international law, are becoming uh, increasingly interdependent. Uh, and it's important, I think, that we both uh, engage with each other and that each understands uh, the, the other's point of view. Uh, so this is, I think, something for organisers to consider 
uh, in the future. I'm sure, certainly not um, proposing that the conference be turned into a public international law conference, and I bear in mind Richard Hart's observations on the first day that there are already enough conferences for those people. Uh, we need one for the domestic public lawyers, and this has certainly been the most wonderfully fruitful occasion. Uh, but we might perhaps consider having at least a session in which we compare our approaches uh, to international law and the interaction uh, that it undoubtedly has with our uh, own domestic public law systems. So thank you very much, Cambridge organising crew, for this wonderful conference, for the wonderful tweeting. Um, it has been a privilege and a pleasure to be involved, and uh, I wish you happy recovery time for the next few weeks. Thank you. <laughs>
that we need uh, to be able to meet in the future. So for me, these are the areas of administrative activity to which I want to turn my very limited amount of attention and which I think badly need input from public law and public lawyers. So I recommend everybody to think hard about the future. I think it's perhaps important that we should try to leave our comfort zone, which is arguments over proportionality versus reasonableness and rationality, and learn to grapple with the development of the transnational administrative state, globalised distributive governance, and as Michael Powers put it, the risk regulation of absolutely everything. And this, I think, is enough to keep you going, John, for a dozen future conferences. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Helen. David. Thank you. Um, I have had a wonderful time, and, and I too would like to thank the organisers for involving me. Um, and, and thinking about the things that, uh, the ideas that have been triggered in my, um, in what, what I call my mind, um, <laughs> over the last few, few days, has been, uh, the, 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 first of all, the first idea is what an extraordinarily broad church we are. We, we, we have people here um, who range from those who are very interested in the public, but not, dare I say, much interested in law, from the people who are terribly interested in law, but much less interested in um, the, at least the philosophy of the public. And um, that's, I think, a good thing. Um, I, I, I'm not too worried about that. I'm prepared to talk to anyone. I'm not a snob, really. Um, uh, but, but the range is just fantastic. And it made me think about where, um, where public law scholarship particularly may be heading. Um, it seems to me that, that, that there are two um, points that I... I, I, I that worry me, actually. Um, and everyone's been very upbeat so far, so I'm going to be a bit downbeat and share my worries with you. And in relation to the themes of the conference, the first relates to substance and the second relates to process. In relation to substance, I think we're in grave danger of having large parts of the uh, public law, both nationally and, and internationally, um, taken over by concerns which aren't really legal concerns. They're concerns about values rather than concerns about law. Um, it seems to me that there is a very important job that public law does, and that is to try to uh, stop the agents of the state from doing things um, in ways that are unlawful and cause serious um, evils. Now that's a, a, a noble task, but it does depend on having law, and that in my view as an unreconstructed positivist depends on having laws, things that we can look at and say with a reasonable degree of confidence um, uh, will allow us to predict outcomes, to advise clients, um, uh, to persuade if necessary judges and will allow judges to do things for themselves. Once one gets away from that and starts talking not about rules, not even about principles, uh, not even, heaven help us, um, about rights, uh, about which I'm profoundly skeptical myself, um, but about values, then I'm afraid we have sold the pass, rather. We have given up um, the uh, hard-edged tools which make public law and public lawyers and their work um, possible and useful. So I, I, would, I would be inclined to push back from vague notions about, uh, 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 about for example, 
um, proportionality and, and so on towards something which will actually allow us to advise clients and persuade judges and decide cases. Um, it's not about perfectibility, public law. We are not a perfectionist uh, undertaking. We are a, uh, a, a group of people who in the end are in the job of providing protection against the worst excesses of state power. And if we aim for per perfectionism, then we will lose, in the end, the ability to do what I regard as our core job. So that's my substance worry. The other uh, second worry concerns process. Um, and I'm not going to get into the discussion, which is very interesting, but ultimately I feel unhelpful about what is substance and what is process. Um, but it seems to me that a lot of public law scholarship today is directed to um, not asking what decision is to be made, but how should make it, how should it be made, and perhaps more important to these people who like this sort of thing, who should make it? Now, as a lawyer, I, that doesn't worry me in the least. If it's a legal question, and I think most of the things we deal with are legal questions, then we have a duty as lawyers to deal with them. And if we're judges, we have to deal with them as judges. Talk of deference, talk of variable um, standards of review or variable intensities of review really are not helpful in that because they hide the fact, and it is a brute fact, I think, that judges, once a case is before them, will have to decide the case. If the judge says, deference, deference, I don't feel, you know, I am not worthy to decide this case, that is deciding the case. It's just saying you are not going to have a remedy. So we can't escape from the necessity to decide cases by saying, oh, we're not the right people to decide it. If we're going to be sensible public lawyers, we need to take questions about justiciability, deference, varying intensity of review, democratic accountability, political responsibility and so on, and say those are all very interesting questions, but they are questions for political philosophers, not public lawyers. And so a great deal of, of what passes as public law scholarship these days seems to me to have precious little to do with public law as I understand it. But then I'm an old reactionary fart. <laughs> And the only thing that's changed is that I used to be a young reactionary fan. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm not saying that this is a new phenomenon. It was something that in politics and in, in, in law was noted almost exactly 100 years ago by one A.V. Dicey. Some of you will remember the name. Um, <laughs> who was a very determined lawyer, a public constitutional lawyer. And um, reviewing, as he, as he prepared in, in 1914, the introduction to the, uh, the, the eighth edition of his introduction to the study of the law of the Constitution, <laughs> Dicey noted four, you might call them themes, but four areas of uh, new constitutional thinking. Uh, that had emerged in the 30 years since the publication of his first edition. And the four were woman's suffrage, proportional <laughs> representation, federalism, and the referendum. Now, it's worth noting that at least three of those remain both topical and to some extent controversial today, and at least two of them will be even more topical and controversial tomorrow. <laughs> but he went on to, to, to note two things about these. The first was that these novelties weren't actually novelties. Um, very little real ingenuity had been put 
by politicians and by implication constitutional lawyers into the development of, of, of public law in this country during those 30 years compared to the amount of ingenuity that has been put into doing things like, um, like developing railways and steamships and such like. Um, what was new was that people were newly interested in them. But the second thing, which is much more important, I think, for our purposes, is, is that he said we've rather lost sight of the fact that there are two important uh, qualities of law. One is that it should be good or wise, and the other is that it shouldn't outrage public opinion. Now, he said all those four novelties, so-called, had been devoted to the second of those, making sure that as far as possible, laws don't outrage public opinion. And remarkably little effort had been put in to the equally, if not more important, task of making sure that law is good and wise. Now, I'm afraid that the type of scholarship which focuses on who should decide and on the processes by which the decision should be made, rather than on what decision would be good and wise, that seems to me to be unfortunate and likely to lead to a, um, both a, a less effective and also a, a, a somewhat impoverished public law. Those of you who are still awake will have noticed that there's a certain, shall we say, creative tension between my first point and my second. But I'm going to stop and leave you to sort that out. <laughs> Sorry, trying to get the mic. Maybe I should move to your. No, it doesn't work that far. Do you want to come here? That might be a bit dumb. That's okay. Don't worry. John here just took emergency measures to cool us off. It's really hot at the front. So I'm well aware that I'm the only person who stands between you and your taxi or you and your beer, and in fact, between me and my beer. So I'm not going to spend. A long time uh, either uh, defending uh, the last uh, 30 years of Canadian administrative law jurisprudence against David or pointing out the contradiction which he alerted us to between uh, saying that we should be lawyers, not political philosophers, and then telling us that what we should be focusing on is whether laws are good or, and wise rather than on uh, legal issues. So I'm not going to do that. And, uh, what, I will point out, although he says that he's not a snob, which I believe, I did discover during this conference that he's actually quite a violent man. <laughs> you might recall that in uh, the session where Mark Aronson and I spoke and David presided, he at one point threatened to reach for his revolver <laughs> if I uh, used the word parliamentary intention again. And I, I never thought I'd think there was anything in common between you and Joseph Goebbels, but uh, <laughs> that's one thing I've discovered at this uh, conference. My friend Joseph would have had another reason as well. <laughs> yeah. So I want to go back to the theme that John Laws uh, introduces, tension between individual and state, and also to the theme that Jerry Mayshaw introduced about uh, public reason. And I'm just going to mention my friend uh, Thomas Hobbes briefly, because I do think that it was Hobbes who came up with uh, the first attempt to understand the state uh, legally, that is, as an artificial person who speaks through law, and when officials speak in the state's name, they have to speak in the language of legal reason. And I think this is a very important idea because it fits with the assumption of uh, most of us here, I think, that uh, the administrative state is legitimate. We don't think that there's a new despotism out there that has to be combated, but what we want to do is to try to understand its uh, legitimacy, which requires us in part understanding how that state is legally conditioned, including how it can be understood as a reason-giving institution. And this seemed to me to be a theme, although I know it's one I wanted to impose on the conference, that uh, did run through the conference. And I was reminded uh, by the session I attended on uh, legitimate expectations of uh, something that uh, a great public lawyer and a uh, great friend to many people here uh, once said to me, and I'm, of course, recalling the person that uh, Carol uh, recalled uh, 
Mike Taggart. And I, I think for those to the many to whom he was such a great friend, his absence at this conference has been uh, quite palpable. So I was writing uh, with Mike and with uh, Murray Hunt an article about the long journey from a New Zealand case, uh, Tavita, through an Australian case, uh, Teo, uh, to one of the major Canadian uh, decisions of the last uh, 20 or so years, and that is the Canadian Supreme Court's decision in Baker. And all of these decisions are about the effect, if any, that the ratified but unincorporated Convention on the Rights of the Child should have on deportation decisions. And in all three decisions, the apex court of the country uh, struggled to find a way of giving effect to the Convention so that the best interests of the children would be taken into account in a deportation decision without stepping over the boundaries as they conceive them of uh, the separation of uh, powers. Now, in New Zealand and Australia, as I recall, uh, the vehicle was uh, legitimate expectations. But the fury and scorn that uh, greeted the decision in Australia, Teo, meant that when the Canadian Supreme Court uh, decided uh, its, uh, gave its decision in Baker, uh, mention of uh, the journey that had got these issues to the Canadian Supreme Court uh, was taboo. They couldn't bring themselves to mention either legitimate expectations or Teo. So the court got to its result through a, a kind of interpretive uh, process, which was on the face of it quite different from the legitimate expectations device that had been relied on by the New Zealand and Australian courts. And uh, Mike uh, thought this was uh, quite interesting. Why? Because uh, what he thought was that if you abstracted from the different routes that uh, the courts had come to uh, reach really quite uh, similar decisions, we would find something like a common project in common law countries, and that the courts were trying to understand uh, that administrative decision makers should be understood as giving reasons to those who are subject uh, to their power, and what's more, reasons that are qualitatively different from the kind of cost-benefit reasons that Jerry Mayshaw told us we might want to think uh, administrative decision makers should get away from. So qualitatively good reasons. And this is what all three courts uh, were interested in. Now, Mike was uh, far more skeptical than I am, uh, both about the prospects for achieving this end, legitimating the administrative state, and he was also far more skeptical about the role of judges in helping us uh, to get there. But I do like to think that much, uh, perhaps uh, all of this conference, has been about the tension between liberty and authority that I think John Laws alerted us to at the beginning, and the role of legal public reason, legal public reason, so I think that my friend David and I actually share a uh, desire to focus on the legal here, uh, in managing uh, that uh, tension. So that's all I have to say, but before you clap for me, you've already, I think, uh, clapped for the organizers at the end of each presenter's uh, brief presentation today, but I would like you to ignore me now and just join us all in thanking yes. the four people who did so much hard work yes. to make this such a great conference, so thank yes. you. Thank you. Good. Well, um, if they've been very good in letting you, let you go home a bit early. <laughs> um, can I first thank the participants? Um, in one sense, the conference wouldn't work without the participants, but um, you've been particularly good first as contributors of papers with posting them, uh, giving them to us in advance, and therefore enabling others to engage with your work and to think about it. And secondly, your contribution in the various sessions have been really good debates, engaging with the issues, and encouraging each other to, 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 to develop new ideas. And I think what has come out of this is very much a range of new ideas, and, and as colleagues here have, have already indicated, a range of agendas that need to be taken forward. Um, it's been a broad-ranging uh, conference, even within a particular theme uh, or, or, or process and substance, and there have been wide-ranging discussions on a variety of areas of public law. Um, and the quality of the papers have been 
well-developed but provisional. And I think that's been the neat er, way that you've come to this conference, throwing ideas in but that are well-developed, representing the research you've been doing for, for a while, and yet open to the views of other people before they get finalized in some form of publication. Um, and I think what it does is to reveal the health of public law scholarship as a research field in the academy. Um, and if we've done nothing more, we can demonstrate that public law in the variety, wide variety that Charles was pointing to, and maybe that there are other areas that we didn't cover, um, is a field of vibrant activity across the common law world. Um, there's been a good debate, as others have said, between the different common law countries, but there have been noticeably uh, people here from non-common law countries uh, taking part and observing our scholarship and contributing. And that's actually very good because what it means is that common law scholarship is not sort of introverted, but actually able to go look outwards. And the sort of contributions and debates have been about, about contacts, Cheryl was pointing to Rick Rawlings and others, um, have shown that, that, in a sense, the common law doesn't exist in a bubble. It, it, it interacts in different ways in different parts of the world. Uh, and that is a, an important contribution that we make, not only to our own jurisdictions, but to the jurisdictions which are our neighbors. Um, and I think what people have done by keeping to time um, is to enable debate with a lots of people participating. Um, our thanks obviously go to Richard Hart, not only for the financial contribution, but also for helping us to design, based on his experience, um, a form of conference that will work. Um, obviously, there are potential issues, of, oh no, and we will be very um, keen to receive uh, ideas about how the conference might be work better or what things we should keep and what things we should, should ditch um, for, for, for the next conference in, in September 2016. But you know, I, I think Richard has been a, a great support and we look forward to, in particular, the opportunity to publish with uh, Bloomsbury Heart Publications, um, a collection of some of the essays. Um, we obviously won't be able to include all, we will be limited to probably about a dozen, um, but I hope that you know, the quality of the work has been such that, that, that even if uh, we're not able to include in that particular publication, I'm sure there will be other outlets um, for the really tremendous research that's going on in the field. Um, my sort of final remarks are for uh, the three gentlemen sitting in the front here. Um, Jason and Mark spent a lot of time conceiving this project, um, not merely conceiving it as an intellectual project, as a, 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 a thematic project, but very much thinking about mechanics and what they put in place a year or so ago in terms of mechanical structures um, have seamlessly managed to enable the kind of discussion that we've had across the various panels. And they have put in a tremendous amount of work, uh, and I'm very indeed, grateful indeed for what they've done. Um, equally, Philip has been uh, a, a, a great contributor, not only to the academic side, but the, the gray hairs you may be seeing or on, 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 uh, developing on his hair now are to do with um, the practical organization of things like accommodation and food, uh, which have uh, posed a few problems from time to time. Um, so uh, uh, you know, I think the three of them have done a, a tremendous job. I've just been sort of back, back uh, uh, the eminence grease in the background, but not actually uh, doing a great deal of the practical stuff that they've done. Um, and our thanks also to Anna Julia, uh, Barry, Chinton, Lorna, Nikki Forrest, and Shona, um, who've been the assistants, who've been seamlessly supporting uh, 
uh, the conference um, and making sure that there haven't been too many problems, too many disasters uh, occurring. Um, but can we can thank those six for their, their contribution, please? <laughs> and so my, my final words are simply safe journey and see you again in September 2016. Yes. Well, thank you, John.